Hi, and welcome back to the Wellby Show and Podcast. I am thrilled to have Dr. Bill Rawls, who has been on the show before, and I'm so excited to have him as one of the few repeat guests that we have on this show because he has an awesome new book that I think is just a totally fascinating topic, and I wanted him to be here. So Dr. Rawls, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So for any of you who haven't heard his uh, previous episode on the Wellby show and podcast, uh, definitely listen to it. But if you aren't familiar with who he is, Dr. Rawls is a conventionally trained physician who gravitated towards herbs and other natural therapies uh, for healing chronic diseases after his own battle with chronic Lyme disease. You know, after a couple of years of using herbs and other natural therapies, he was victorious in healing himself and decided to, you know, bring that to thousands of people all over the world with his work and also his books. Today's topic is a funny term, I think, uh, cellular wellness. It doesn't sound very sexy right off the bat, but once you understand more about what that means, it's super interesting and has to do with aging as well as healing. Cellular wellness, Dr. Rawls, what does that actually mean? Yeah, it's, um, it is a mouthful, but people are getting used to it. And once you understand it, it, it really makes sense. When you take our understanding of health, down to the cellular level, you simplify our understanding of chronic illness, cancer, and how we should deal with it. So, you know, to most people, chronic illness, cancer, all of these things that we deal with seem very complicated. Our conventional medical system makes them complicated. There's thousands upon thousands of diagnoses and all these different tests and all these different treatments. And when you bring it down to the cellular level, you really change that equation completely. It, it, it's a different conversation and one that is more apt to lead to wellness than, than the other. Got it. So you talked, I, I was happy to go through your book and what I saw and what I thought was interesting and I wanted you to talk more about was the idea of stress because it feels like in today's day and age, there's so much related to stress and there's such an emphasis on self-care and doing things for your stress. Um, but I think that stress is something we can't escape, right? It, we've never been able to escape it. And, you know, homo sapiens, we're dealing with, uh, you know, food scarcity and uh, accidents and they had stress too, but it's, it's very different kinds of stress. So, um, it's not that we can escape our stress, I believe, it's about how you deal with it. So on that topic, what does stress have to do with our body and aging? And what do cells have to do with our body and aging? And what's the connection there? Yeah, that, that's where it really gets interesting. And it, you know, it, <laughs> it seems so simple to me now, it took me a decade to get to this and three years to actually put it into a book and make sense out of it. But we don't think about ourselves this way, our body, but it's um, we're, we're basically a collection of cells and all of our cells work together to make us function as a unit, but we're made of trillions of cells. Every cell in the body has a job. Every cell is an independently functioning unit. And as such, Every cell in the body needs specific things. It needs nutrients. It needs downtime to recover from being stressed. So when you look at health from a cellular point of view, it's really all about health of your cells. If your cells are healthy, if each of the cells in your body are functional, prime working order, and everything is functioning in synchrony. So when, you know, we talk a lot about hormones and chemical messengers and neurotransmitters, and basically what that is, is a conversation between cells. Cells have to stay in constant communication with one another to work together. And our brain is overseeing the whole thing. So our, our brain is using our five senses to, to monitor what's going on in the inside and the outside, and then use hormones and neurotransmitters to balance all of those cellular functions so everything is going just right. So if you feel good, it's because all your cells are healthy, and it's as simple as that. And if you don't feel good, it means your cells are stressed. So 
you mentioned stress, right? There are different kinds of stress, right? I think you were referring to mental stress, correct? That psychological stress that we all have of just pushing that button every day of having to meet schedules and keep up with life. And it just seems to be never ending. But I define five categories of stress that actually affect our cells in different ways. So there's nutritional stress, and that's getting a lot of people. This high carbohydrate, high processed food diet isn't giving our cells the right nourishment. So our cells are compromised right from the beginning. We have a lot of toxic stress. We're constantly exposed to abnormal radiation from devices and toxic substances from petroleum use. So that weakens our cells. These chemicals get embedded in our cells and compromise functions. Mental stress, which you mentioned, uh, the big thing there is all of our functions have to be coordinated. And we do better when our brain is relaxed and all of those functions are just kind of status quo. But mental stress, we have the perception that there is a threat, that basically a saber-toothed tiger is running after us all the time. And that's not natural for us. You know, those kinds of stresses used to be intermittent. So it keeps our body in a fight or flight mode. And that keeps our cells on high alert so they don't have town time to recover from other kinds of stresses just from that day-to-day -day work. So that's an issue, but then it affects our sleep and our cells need downtime. We need sleep to recalibrate our brain and for our cells to recover from working all day. Fourth category is physical stress, and that can be trauma, just you know, getting beat up, um, but also being sedentary. When we're sedentary, we don't move blood. Our cells need blood to clear metabolic debris and congestion. And the fifth category, we'll get into this one, is microbe stress. And that's a big one that we'll talk about too. So it depends on the kinds of stress, but when your cells are stressed, they can't do their job and you feel bad. Simple as that. I was so happy to just hear you describe the connection between a sedentary lifestyle and, and cell health, because I've never heard it described that way. And you've heard over and over how sitting is the new smoking and how, you know, it's bad for you, but I've never really, you know, in my mind gone deeper as to why, which is unusual because I'm all about understanding root causes of things. Um, but that was a, a great light bulb that I'm going to call my father right after this and tell him as I sometimes have to get him moving. But anyway, so thank you for describing how stress, these different stressors impact uh, our cells. And now can you explain this process of how stressed cells could make you prematurely age faster or just age faster, you know, I don't know if it's prematurely or whatever right. it is, but what's, what's that connection there? That's, you know, the interesting thing about this journey is you can literally describe anything about health or absence of health illness in terms of cells, but you can also describe aging in terms of cells. So our cells, we're constantly losing cells, making new cells. We have a lot of cellular turnover in our body that occurs every day. Some cells, like we're constantly losing skin cells, we don't lose uh, nerve cells or heart cells quite as much. The turnover is much slower, so different cells in the body. But what aging specifically is, is the gradual loss of functional cells in the body. And it has to do with the fact that we gradually, cells gradually, just from working and churning it out, gradually burn out their mitochondria so they don't have the ability, they basically lose the ability to generate energy. So we're constantly having this cellular attrition. So we accumulate cells until age 20. And at that point, your body has five to 10 times the number of cells that it actually needs to function. So you feel great when you're 20, you feel invulnerable because here you are, all your cells are brand spanking new and you have all this, these extra cells that you have, you know, you can lose some along the way. After that point though, you gradually lose cells. And 
if it were just from that normal process of mitochondrial energy loss, it is estimated that we would all live about up to about 120 in the absence of any stress. But when your cells are stressed, they use more energy, they burn down their mitochondria faster, so you lose cells faster. That, that attrition uh, is accelerated. So the more stressed you are, whether that's nutritional stress, microbe stress, mental stress, whatever, the more you're stressing the cells, the faster you're gonna burn out cells and the quicker you reach that, that, uh, that point where your body just can't maintain itself anymore. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation. That's really enlightening. So, okay, so we've got the 120 years old is, is so interesting to me because you see that with the blue zones, right? It's people right. who have done so much to keep up healthy cells and seemingly float into their, you know, post a hundred year old death because they don't have chronic disease and, and they're still walking and moving as if, you know, a lot of 80 year olds in America might, because they have seemingly the same cellular age, right? Um, because a lot of Americans are stressing out their cells, their whole lives with all this processed food and environmental toxicity and et cetera. Yeah. So that's really cool. So obviously you are a wealth of knowledge on herbs and a big proponent of them, both in your own experience and, and so many patients around the world that you've helped. So what do herbs and plants, I am sort of using them interchangeably, but what do herbs do or what's the role that they have in protecting cells or improving cellular health? Well, you know, when I was in my Lyme struggle, I couldn't find any good solutions. And I happened to read a book that defined that lots of plants, lots of herbs have antimicrobial properties and people were using them with Lyme disease. So I tried it and it worked for me. And I've spent the past decade of my life, first of all, robustly well, and second, really trying to figure out this herb thing. And I've come to different conclusions uh, than maybe people are thinking about herbs. So we tend to think about herbs like drugs, you know, that we have a symptom or a problem and we take an herb to fix that. And herbs typically don't seem as potent and they take a lot longer to work. So it really sent that question of why is that? You know, what, what's going on there? And I, I came to realize that drugs and herbs are really two different things. I mean, it's like apples and oranges. So what drugs are doing is blocking enzymes or activating receptor pathways specifically to artificially block a symptom or artificially uh, slow down a disease process by manipulating cellular functions. What they are not doing, what no drug has the capacity to do, though, is reduce cellular stress. So when you look at chronic illness, you can define it as chronic cellular stress. In other words, the stresses are ongoing, cells aren't recovering, so you have chronic cellular dysfunction. And that's where symptoms, chronic symptoms come from. So what drugs are doing is manipulating that so we feel it less. What the herbs are doing is counteracting cellular stress. And that was just, a, it was like a light bulb when I realized what was going on. So we talked about those five stress factors, right? So there are many, many herbs that have the effect of counteracting all of those things. Herbs have anti-diabetic properties. Hundreds of herbs have anti-diabetic properties that they either, either protect our cells from excessive carbohydrate consumption or normalize insulin levels. Many herbs protect the liver in that detoxification process or help our cells uh, purge toxins. Uh, many of our herbs have chemical messengers that balance those abnormal responses to that we have to stress. They basically balance our stress hormones. Herbs promote blood flow to enhance, the, enhance that uh, vascular purging of toxins and things from cells. And turns out that virtually all herbs have antimicrobial properties. So asking why, it's, um, 
you know, it, it really stands to reason that plants are doing this to protect their own cells. So plants are really sophisticated chemists and they produce a wide spectrum of chemical substances to neutralize free radicals and all kinds of other toxic stress factors, including a wide spectrum of microbes. But it's not a single chemical like a drug. It's like a whole defense and regulatory system that you're taking in. And the plants we define as herbs are plants that humans have found just mesh well with our biochemistry. And, you know, that was a selective process. It's been going on for thousands and possibly even hundreds of thousands of years. So we naturally know which ones to avoid. You know, nobody would make the mistake of eating poison ivy twice. Right. So, yeah, the herbs are the things that, that work for us. So I have two questions based on what you're just saying. First, you said we found out that all herbs are antimicrobial, and I did not realize that. I thought that, you know, certain herbs were antifungal, certain herbs were antiviral. Uh, certainly there's ones we know, we see over and over that are known to uh, combat the Lyme bacteria. So what do you mean by that they're all antimicrobial? Do they all fight all the different microbes? Like even, you know, I don't know, dill weed, like everything? Uh, actually, yes, they all have some antimicrobial properties. They have to. In fact, every living organism on earth has to protect itself from other kinds of creatures. I mean, basically, we're all food for something else. Everything living is food. And we are food for bacteria, but plants are food for insects and bacteria and viruses. And, you know, so, so it's the food cycle and we're all part of it. So, Plants uh, have this defense system that's a little bit like our immune system. Our immune system is cellular, plants, there's chemical. So when we take that in, it actually benefits us. And how much of an antimicrobial property an herb has depends on the environment of the plant. So some plants in certain environments have less microbial stress and aren't going to have as robust um, an antimicrobial coverage where some plants are, it's very, very strong. But either way, yeah, that was a realization just in writing the book. You know, I was very familiar with herbs that have been recognized for strong antimicrobial properties that we use for Lyme disease and a lot of other things. But then I started looking at the herbs that we generally use for everyday health, like adaptogens, like rhodiola, and reishi and turmeric for inflammation. So some of these herbs aren't really recognized. You know, it wasn't something that we were using in chronic Lyme disease or other kinds of things for their antimicrobial properties. So I started looking it up and yeah, every single herb that I looked at, every single one, somebody had done studies and found that they had at least basic antiviral, antibacterial, antiprotozoal, antifungal properties, every single one of them. Wow. That's really cool. This sounds maybe absurd, but I am very visual. So can you explain? Well, first of all, I know that there are trillions of cells in our body, some of which are human cells and belong to us, but most of them are microbial cells that, you know, do our digesting for us and, and live amongst us actually in harmony. So when you say that herbs can improve our cellular health, are you talking about only our human cells or are they also improving the health of the, you know, good microbes that live within us? Yeah. Well, you know, it, as far as the microbes that are part of us, you have to remember that they're all there to get something to eat. I mean, basically. So Yes, we all have microbes in our body. It is true that the numbers of microbes um, rival our cells, but you have to remember that a bacteria is a thousand to a hundred times smaller than one of our cells. So, you know, compared to us, our total bacterial content is probably about two pounds. And most of that is actually in our colon. So they're a lot smaller than, than we are. Um, but interestingly, you know, when we look at our microbes, most of them are on the gut and on the skin. And I think everybody's aware of that. It's typically called the gut microbiome, the body microbiome. Um, so we do have a lot of bacteria that uh, we uh, have symbiotic relationships with. 
but they're not all good. So, you know, we all carry bad stuff. We've all got Canada and C. diff and all of these things that are really uh, potentially uh, harmful to us in our gut and on our skin. Um, we have bacteria like P. acnes that can cause acne and staphylococcus, which can become invasive on our skin. And we depend on our normal flora to keep those things in check. So our immune system doesn't extend into the gut, into the contents of the gut, and it doesn't extend out on the skin. So we actually depend on their normal flora, which secretes substances that keep those bacteria in check. And it's a symbiotic relationship. Those bacteria, our normal flora, they're not doing it for us. They're doing it to cut the competition. We just benefit from it. But when you look at herbs, one of the interesting things of the herbs compared to antibiotics is antibiotics are indiscriminate. They kill all bacteria. You take a back, uh, antibiotic for a few weeks, and it's going to really disrupt your gut and potentially cause bacterial resistance. Herbs don't do this. And somebody, I actually found a study that they, they documented this that herbs, you're talking about a system that is selective. It does not disrupt normal flora. It does help us suppress pathogens. So it's helping to balance the gut. I found that the, the, the various herbs that we use do a better job of balancing uh, gut flora in the gut and on the skin than probiotics do, which is really interesting. That is interesting. Do herbs improve the health of our flora? Uh, yeah. Well, just by helping them cut their competition too, you know? Oh, okay. So um, more about so, just allowing them to flourish on their own by right. getting rid of their, their enemies. Yeah. Uh, I always visualize uh, those beautiful National Geographic films with the blue whale and all of the plankton and other small fish like swimming with it just to get whatever it's kind of, you know, yeah. leaving behind and, and this beautiful ecosystem that, you know, they're all doing each other a favor by, <laughs> by uh, swimming together. So I, I think of that when I think of our, um, our flora. So you talked about herbs and their impact on bad microbes and how they can help our human cells. Walk me through this little visualization I have. So if I take an herb, you know, let's say I take it um, in extract form. So like a, a tincture or something, right? So it goes through my digestive system and then gets absorbed in my gut and, you know, used in whatever way my body decides to use it. How does that get through to all of the different cells in my body, which you were talking about somewhere in the brain, somewhere in the heart, somewhere, you know, on the skin. How does that work? Well, it just circulation. I mean, all of these chemicals are readily absorbed. Uh, you know, we, think about it. I mean, we've been consuming plants since the beginning of time. And if you go back to when humans were eating a forage food diet, which is most of our time, hundreds of thousands of years of our history, they were eating wild plants. So they were getting a lot of these chemicals that we call phytochemicals. So these plant chemicals, plant, phyto means plant, so plant chemicals. And again, it's more like consuming a system rather than this random collection. So the plant is using these substances to protect itself and regulate functions within the plant to keep it normal. So basically it's like us embracing the plant's immune and regulatory systems to boost our own. And we've been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years. So we, in a sense, it's like we depend on this and we were getting it for a long time, but now we're not as much, you know, as we've cultivated our foods, we've moved away from wild plants and except for basic culinary herbs, you know, we're eating plants that are cultivated to produce calories, not to produce phytochemicals. So a lot of our food plants have lost their ability to, uh, to protect themselves. That's why we have to use so much herbicide and pesticide in our plants, because they they're, not, they're not groomed to protect themselves anymore. They're groomed to produce calories. In addition, we're eating mostly seeds. We're eating grains and beans more than anything else. And that's the lowest concentration of these protective phytochemicals that you can get. 
So all of this stuff, these protective phytochemicals that have been just a part of us for hundreds of thousands of years, we've selectively gotten rid of them. And to a degree that we're really suffering from it over the past hundred years, because we're all eating mostly grain and meat. Interesting. Wow. That is so interesting. So in the absence of these incredible plants and their antimicrobial and anti-stressor or healing properties, what role do bad microbes play in accelerating aging and um, causing chronic illness? I, I know some of this, but I, I want to hear you explain it for, for everybody else. You know, I, I'll try to make it as brief as I can. And it, it's, it's a big focus of the book and my ongoing studies is this concept of dormancy. And, and this, this is a pretty new thing. Um, this is new science, um, you know, things that people are just starting to pay attention to in the science world. The realization that the things that get into our system through tick bites, through things we put in our mouths when we're kids, through exposure to other people, uh, respiratory infections, COVID, influenza, all of these things that we're exposed to through our lifetime enter our body. So they can enter through the GI tract, they can enter through the lungs, they can enter through breaks in the skin, and they end up in our bloodstream. And that causes a war with our immune system. And it's generally thought, well, you know, we have an infection, we feel the infection. And if once our symptoms resolve, whether we take antibiotics or whatever, or not, once the symptoms are resolved, the microbe is gone. And it turns out that they, that may be much less true than we think, that these things can become embedded in our cells. All of these bacteria, viruses, protozoa, all these things we're exposed to from the outside. And it turns out that things are constantly trickling across our skin and from our gut. Um, into our bloodstream, these things can become dormant inside our cells, in our brain, in tissues throughout our body, in our liver, everywhere. So healthy cells, you're, you're, you know, ba basically when a bacteria or other kind of microbe invades a cell, one of three things can happen. Either the bacteria, the microbe wins, and it takes over the cell and uses the cell basically as food to, and resources to generate more microbes. Or the bacteria it can be expelled. And you know we, we hear a lot about the immune system, but a realization that I came upon is our cells can defend themselves. Our cells can expel microbes, invasive microbes. And if they're healthy, they can do that. But, you know, there's a lot of give and take that's been going on for a long time. And sometimes what happens in a healthy cell is the microbes become dormant. So they're small. They're a thousand to a hundred times smaller than our cells. So we can actually harbor bacteria in our cells that are dormant, not alive, but not dead either, not active, that don't hinder functions of the cell. And they can be reactivated later. If your cells, you know, if you eat bad food, stay chronically stressed, exposed to toxins, don't exercise, and you stress your cells chronically, all the things that you've been collecting through your lifetime can reactivate. And it is a model that's being defined as a potential explanation for all chronic illnesses. And we have different chronic illnesses because we all pick up different microbes as we go through life. Again, this is all new stuff, but it has the potential to really change our understanding of what chronic illness is, but also change our understanding of how we should look at solutions. And it puts cellular wellness right at the heart of it. If your cells aren't healthy, then you're vulnerable. And it's as simple as that. Right. I've, I've, recorded a lot of interviews with a lot of different experts and the topic of chronic disease and, and microbes has come up a lot because I think that connection is very clear now, especially in light of uh, recent research around Epstein-Barr virus and MS and Epstein-Barr virus and long COVID and your knowledge and you know speaking out about how much these other uh, viral infections impact chronic Lyme. Chronic Lyme doesn't you know exist in isolation. And so 
all of that together, people's understanding of why you get certain chronic illnesses, right? Like if all the different autoimmune conditions are just really the same thing, your body's attacking yourself. Why do some people get lupus? Some people get, you know, a, a Hashimoto. Some people just have mild Hashimoto. Some people it's really quite bad, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, but all these different things. And that could be the explanation, right? Is that it, we're picking up these it, different microbes. Really. Yeah. Yeah. That we all pick up different microbes as we go through life. You know, some people get tick bites and get some of those microbes and, and, and we pick up things throughout, but it's everything. I mean, I was, interestingly, I was uh, just looking at the full spectrum of things and uh, looking at people who survived Ebola in Africa several years ago, you know, the mortality is about 60%, but 40% of people survived. And, and some of those people actually regain normal health. And those that regain normal health, they were still able to find Ebola virus in their tissues. So their cells had recovered, their immune system had recovered, but they hadn't gotten rid of the, the, the microbe. So my theory is, and this is a theory shared by many others, a growing number of people that, you know, we get different illnesses because we all pick up different microbes in our lifetime and different microbes have preference for different cells in the body. So when these things reactivate, we get different symptoms. Symptoms are basically cells being stressed. You know, if you have a symptom, you can track it to the type of cell. A symptom is dysfunction, a cellular dysfunction. And, um, you know, whether it's a headache or a muscle ache or whatever, um, you've lost that function because the cellular functions are compromised. And looking at this dormant microbe model, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty fascinating. Wow, that's so cool. Okay, I want you to talk a little bit more about this because it's opening the doors for me. So let's say, because again, I need to visualize, uh, as I'm sure some other people listening to this might, might feel the same way, but if you have bloating, right, that's a symptom, um, you have bloating, it's dysfunction of a certain type of cell, and you're saying that, that it's also probably linked to the fact that that person picked up a microbe that targets that exact cell that is dysfunctioning and causing bloating. Is that understanding correct? No, I, you know, when I, I think everybody is looking for the microbe that causes the problem. And I think that's a real mistake. You know, they've, they've, they've looked for the microbe that causes dementia, you know, and when you look at acute illnesses, acute infections, um, that uh, holds true. But when you look at reactivation of microbes, you know, we, we see Epstein-Barr, but when they start measuring other things, they find other things are reactivated too. And you have to kind of think through, well, what is the symptom? What's the dysfunction going on with the symptom? So when we look at bloating, um, that's a pretty good example of thinking through, well, what's going on here? So bloating is generally a, a, a symptom of uh, slow intestinal motility, right? So the food we eat is broken and we absorb it, but a lot of it is used to feed our bacteria. We have bacteria, uh, the lowest concentration in the stomach, but it moves all the way through and increases till we get to the large colon. So they're bacteria in the small intestine. When you eat, you're feeding those bacteria, and you have to keep that food moving because as long as food is present, bacteria keep growing. And when bacteria grow, they ferment and produce gas. So if you have slow motility, typically from chronic mental stress and other kinds of issues, sometimes just eating the wrong foods, the bacteria keep growing and they're not moving through. We're not pushing them through and getting them on, on out. So they're fermenting, producing gas. And that gets trapped in the small bowel. It can't go back up through the stomach and it's a long time way to go to get down and out. So you get that symptom of bloating. So it's a symptom of slow motility, slow, and, and, and the bacterial overgrowth that occurs can damage those intestinal cells. And that aggravates that intestinal motility even more and it slows it down. So this chronic slow motility builds up bacteria 
the bacterial overgrowth and you end up with the bloating and gas and discomfort. So, but thinking through the dynamics of symptoms is really interesting as far as, you know, getting, getting to the root of the explanation. So you get to the root causes instead of just treating the symptom, which is typically what we do. Right. Okay. Thank you. That was a good explanation. So going back to herbs in this scenario, uh, or, or rather talking about aging, can you take herbs to heal illness or slow down aging without changing anything else about your lifestyle? Um, will they have any effect or do they really need to be done in conjunction with improving your diet and other helpful lifestyle changes to really work? You know, it's all about cellular health and the herbs are doing a lot to reverse um, a lot of the damage that we self-inflict on ourselves. Um, right now, the rate of chronic illness in this country is running about uh, 60%. 60% of Americans are chronically ill. And most of that is self-imposed on eating bad food, being chronically stressed, exposure to toxic substances, the five categories of things that I talk about. So the question is, if people just keep doing that, if they took herbs, would it help? And I think it would. I think it would, that simple thing of taking herbs every day, I think would have an impact in lowering our rate of chronic illness and likely cancer too. I mean, that's another thing that most all of the herbs that you study do have some pretty significant anti-cancer properties. Um, so yes, taking herbs would have an impact, but heck, you know, why, why not do more? You know, I have been taking uh, uh, concentrated herbal extracts for a decade since the time that I would consider myself completely recovered from chronic illness uh, that I defined as chronic Lyme disease. Now I don't even use diagnoses. I just see all of it is, is kind of a similar kind of thing. But I've been taking herbs, but I've also been, you know, I, I'm particular about my diet. I protect my sleep. I try to keep my environment clean. I walk at least three miles a day minimum, but I'm living robust health. You know, I went through my health ordeal when I was 50. I thought at age 50, my joints would be shot. I would, you know, how to have chronic heart conditions. I had high cholesterol. I had all kinds of issues at age 50. I'm 65 now. My blood pressure is normal. My vascular system is great. My cholesterol is normal. Um, and, you know, I don't have the cell capacity that I had at age 30. And, you know, I'm still aging but I'm aging well and I'm aging without symptoms. I'm doing things that I thought I would never do. And I got so much back. All the horrible arthritis that I was having in my 50s is long gone. And you know, my joints are fine. So it's almost it's like you don't remarkable. you obviously have less cells at 65 than you had at 30, but because you've done so much with herbs and other lifestyle changes, you don't. I shouldn't say don't need as many, but the cells you do have are functioning so much better that maybe it's like the That's same it. process as when you were 30, because they were so much more compromised at 30. I have, I have maximized the health potential of the cells that I have. And I think in doing so, I have kept this uh, dormant microbiome in check, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I tested positive for a lot of different microbes at age 50. I don't think I've eradicated those things. I just have uh, put them back in their box, you know? And so you know, our microbiome, uh, what is being called the dormant tissue and blood microbiome, you know, we, we live with that. Um, it's part of us. And when you start looking at other organisms, both animal and plants, you find that virtually every multicellular organism has microbes within its tissues. It's part of us. It's part of life. And so we have to live around that. We have to maximize that cellular health potential. And that's the key to this resilient wellness that we all want to, to keep as long as we can. Great. That's so interesting. So it's clear to me and to you and to many other people that herbs are incredibly powerful on you know, this cellular wellness topic. 
um, or, or at herbs are incredibly powerful at keeping our cells uh, resilient. Um, on, you know, many people take, let's say at least a multivitamin, probably a not great quality multivitamin, but at least a multivitamin a day, right? Right. Why do so few people today, even though you can find all the research out there that you found it exists, take any sort of herbs? You know, I, I think it's slow to change and we adopt truths in our lives. And, and once we have something that we're, we said as a truth of how something we should be, it's very hard to change that, you know. So my goal is to change the way that people are thinking about herbs. You know, people typically think about herbs as something that people who don't want to go to a doctor and use medications are trying to get by with, and they're using them like drugs. And I'm trying to teach people that, no, it's not that way. You know, herbs don't work that way. Um, if you look at back at herbal tradition, there are many herbs that were used on a daily basis just to promote health and wellness. Um, but yeah, that idea, you know, when we were converting more and more to a high calorie diet, um, the food industry recognized, well, you know, we're not giving people the same kinds of nutrients they need as they might have not been getting. So we can just supplement those things with a multivitamin. And I think people, you know, if you go to a health food store, you're going to find nutrients like multivitamins, coenzyme Q10, carnitine, things like that, right there with the herbs. And those are apples and oranges too. Those are two different things. So nutrients are the things that cells need to function. All right. So cells need carbohydrates and fat to generate energy. They need amino acids to build proteins, but they also need vitamins and minerals to use as cofactors to make those things work. So all of those things are basically the functional parts of the cell and they need that stuff and they're constantly wearing out parts and needing to replace parts. So we need those nutrients so cells can function, but we don't need you know, more than the cell can use. And so when we load ourselves with just one multivitamin, especially in a form that isn't necessarily what cells can use, are, you know, we're, are, are we doing that much? And honestly, there's not a lot of evidence that we are, even though half the population is convinced that they need to take a multivitamin. We actually get our vitamins better from natural foods. Um, I think it's fine to take a multivitamin, gives you a little bit extra, but quite frankly, it probably doesn't do that much. So when we look at this protective phytochemistry of the herbs, those aren't nutrients. So herbs aren't a good source of calories. They're not a good source of nutrients. It's all these protective phytochemicals that we're trying to extract from the herb intake. And what those are doing is those are protective functions. So they're reducing cellular stress. So an interesting way to think about it is if you're, if you're reducing cellular stress, then your cells don't work as hard. If your cells don't work as hard, they use less energy. They turn over, there's less wear and tear. They turn over fewer parts, they need less nutrients. Nutrient demand is reduced when you reduce cellular stress. So when, in a way, the herbs are almost doing more, 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 more than your multivitamin, even in the category of nutrients, because you're decreasing nutrient demand. So, but they okay, are- I have an analogy that just came to me and you can tell me if it's right or wrong. It's like, a poor diet or let's say junk food and exercise. So I know some friends who are sort of sugar and junk food fiends and they keep up a diet with a lot of junk food. And as a result are exer exercise junkies. They're so committed to their exercise and they do so much of it. They spend so much time each day exercising and they feel like if they miss a day, they just instantly gain weight, right? And right. I've, I, you know, I've gone through different, stages in life and certainly was a very avid exerciser in college. And over the years kind of realized that I didn't need to exercise that much officially, or, you know, I could do it a few times a week and just kind of walk, um, as a primary mode of exercise in a lot of ways and not gain weight simply by not consuming 
much sugar or not consuming right. much junk food. So in that way, herbs are kind of like the, or, or rather, you know, they're reducing the need for exercise simply by right. not eating as much junk. Is that kind of an analogy that makes sense? Well, yeah, it, yeah, in, in a way that is that, that, you know, it, it does reduce that stress. I mean, it, it's, um, if you're on that pathway of eating junk food, but then exercising to get rid of the calories, I mean, it's carbohydrates are just really, really super high energy and you have to burn that or it, it becomes an issue. So, but with all of with using those high energy foods and then exercising to compensate, I mean, it's kind of like stoking the engine on a Steve locomotive with the brakes on it. And the more you stoke that engine, the more it's the faster it's going to burn out. So exercise is really important. But, I, you know, the main thing, the most important thing we get from exercise is moving blood. So when we exercise, we dilate blood vessels and we uh, spill liquid out into that extracellular space, the space around our cells that washes away toxic buildup, metabolic waste. That's what detoxification all is, is all about. That's the most important step in detoxification. Um, so exercise is important for that, but you have to accept that exercise is also cellular wear and tear. So the more intensely you exercise, the more intensely that you are going to uh, wear your cells out. So it's it's that balance of enough exercise to, to promote something called autophagy, which is cellular repair, you know, enough blood flow to, to purge toxins, but not so much that when you start moving past that capacity of your cells to, to catch up and repair that damage. I can so think of it an is example. A balance. I can think of an example right now of that. A couple of people I know where they have chronically over exercised such that they actually seem a bit, you know, frail and like they've aged poorly yeah. um, versus other people I know who have just kept up a lifestyle of lots of walking and hiking and yoga and whatever. And it seems to be yeah. the right amount of movement for the body to do, you know, that good cellular repair without stressing them out too much. And you mentioned physical stress in the very beginning of this episode as being, if somebody got beat up, but certain kinds of exercise, I feel like are it, being it beat can up. be. Yeah. It was, uh, I I'm, I'm a very active person and I, I enjoy a lot of different kinds of activity, but I'm an avid reader of Outside Magazine, and over the years, they've run several articles on exercise burnout of people who are just extreme athletes, um, ultra marathons, various kinds of really extreme activities that reach a point that they just burn out and their immune system collapses. And I know now, you know, retrospectively, they're just they're stressing their cells so much, they're having reactivation of microbes, and they have all the symptoms of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and chronic Lyme disease. And, you know, it's just another way to get there. I and saw that with a few people I know with um, fertility, they were marathon runners. And yeah. I think the body was so chronically stressed from that amount of, you know, physical trauma or physical stress, uh, you know, beyond what is a normal amount of running that it was proving very hard to get pregnant. And one of the things they were prescribed was stop running marathons and right. that, that helped, you know? Right. Um, so I, I don't deny anybody doing those kinds of activities, but I think you, I, I think you have to be smart about how you're doing it um, and realize that it isn't all health benefits. There is a tax on your body too. Right. And again, it's, it's all about your cells. It's about keeping your cells healthy and that having that balance. Right. And that the man dies right when he gets to marathon. So yeah, that should be, uh, you know, something people shouldn't forget, even if they've done tremendous training, which of course would help. But I, I agree with you. I think that something like that is a feat, not a lifestyle, or eventually your, your cells really do burn out. I want to make sure before we wrap up that people, if you weren't aware of with my first interview with, with Dr. Rawls, the incredible healing power of herbs and just lifestyle 
you know, illness prevention, optimizing for, for anti-aging, like just optimizing for feeling great, all of these things that herbs can do, they're very inaccessible, right? Either people have a health food store in their town and they show up and they have absolutely no idea what they might need. And you can't take every herb that is out there that would just burn you out. Or they have never been to a health food store, don't know anything about it and figure out they might need herbs from something they read about, you know, having Lyme disease and they're thinking, okay, I need to go to like an herbalist. Maybe, you know, I'm thinking of a, a, a Chinese person in a, in a, room with all the different, you know, herbs in jars and they're cooking teas and things like that. Right. So, um, those are the two places I feel like most people feel they could access herbs and very few Americans have access to either of those things. I live in Connecticut and I'm shocked how few health food stores there are. So I, you know, I can't even imagine some other parts of the country and what they have access to. So you know, how can people, you can't buy them at a pharmacy, right? I mean, everybody seems to have a CVS or a, a Walgreens or something in their town, but you can't, you can't really buy them there. So how can people get herbs and how can they make sure that they're taking the right herbs, not too much as well as enough for it to really have an effect on their cells? Yeah, it, it's, uh, well, it, it's honestly the reason that I wrote this most recent book, The Cellular Wellness Solution, is to help guide people because I realized that people really didn't know where to go or where to start. And it, then they found it to be very intimidating. There are herbs out there that do have drug-like properties that probably most people should stay away from. And fortunately, you're not going to find them just on most grocery store shelves or that sort of thing. You can find herbs in pharmacies and groceries. They typically be, tend to be low quality. And if you've taken them, they don't do much because they're low quality. So quality matters. There are many companies that produce uh, excellent quality herbs. Um, there are certain herbs that you can take. Uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of rhodiola, reishi, turmeric, uh, some of my favorites, go to cola, um, milks of thistle. These are herbs you can take every single day, and I have been for almost a decade or more. So there are herbs that are mainly for cellular health, prevention, uh, you know, reduction of cellular stress that promote wellness. Um, and you know, these are these herbs have a low potential to uh, cause adverse reactions. They're very safe to take. So I define those in the book. Um, there are some herbs that we would take more for recovery from various kinds of chronic illness that have maybe a little stronger antimicrobial properties. And I define those herbs in the book also. But for parameters of what to look for, all of those kinds of things are well defined in the book. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the big reason that I, I, I wrote it. Quality of herbs, um, you know, when I was getting into this, I ended up having uh, products made to meet my specifications because it was really hard to find herbs out there. And, and that ended up um, being a supplement company, which I'm part of. But there, there are many good companies out there. And I think the book really sets some standards of looking for quality extracts, looking for the right herbs. And, you know, and, and I, I set up what I call the, uh, uh, the herbal spectrum in the book of, you know, starting at food plants on one end and then the other end, herbs that might have drug-like properties that you would want to stay away from. And, and we created a chart of what we are called safe zone herbs or green zone herbs, herbs that Anybody, you really don't have to consult an herbalist. These are very safe to take on a daily basis, hard to get in trouble with them. So we, we uh, defined a, a pretty good list of herbs that people could start with and feel very comfortable with. I forgot about the grocery store aspect. Of course, things like turmeric and the other things that are in the spice aisle are herbs, of course. Um, so yes, that's a great way. I know like my husband and I make a smoothie most mornings and put turmeric and um, Ceylon cinnamon and a few other things that we know have different good properties that I assume be, would be in your green green zone. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, is that a good way 
that you recommend a lot of people get these green zone herbs uh, day to day, you know, in, in a powder form in a smoothie, or do you think that taking them in like tincture form or capsule form is more effective? Um, there's three main, way, main ways to get herbs. Um, one is a whole herb powder, and that's mostly what you would end up putting in your smoothie. And that's basically they take the entire herb, the entire plant, dry it and crush it up into a powder, into a fine powder. And frankly, you're getting a lot of fiber and not much phytochemistry because you're getting just the stems and roots and leaves or whatever of the plant. They're great, but they're not high potency. They're super, I mean, I add mushroom powders and turmeric and things like that into my smoothies every morning but I don't depend on that. So what we want is that phytochemistry coming from the plant. And so a tincture, basically they take water and alcohol and soak the plant parts in the water and alcohol, extract that really con that phytochemistry. And the more plant you put per water and alcohol, the higher concentration it's gonna be. And after a period of time, you take the plant parts out and discard them. So it's just pure chemistry. So tinctures are good. One step beyond a tincture, and typically what we use in our products, though, is a standardized powdered extract. And what that is, is they take the water alcohol tincture, spray it on a surface, dry off the water and alcohol, and collect the powder. So it's almost pure phytochemistry. So one capsule of that um, may equal like, a several, a couple of teaspoons of a tincture. And it's just a really easy way to get herbs. So most of the herbs I take, I, I use some tinctures, but I use, you know, my daily assortment of herbs, I typically get in uh, standardized powdered extracts. And another thing about herbs is different herbs have slightly different qualities and different, you know, it's like milk thistle, we know protects the liver. Hawthorne, we know protects cells in, in the heart and vascular system. So characteristics of herbs, you get a uh, slightly different uh, a mix of, of qualities. So when you combine herbs, you get this really nice synergy. So using blends, typically uh, the blends that I use uh, or typically like five herbs or so, five to a dozen herbs. And you get this complex synergy of that phytochemistry that has the potential of protecting all the cells in your body. So, you know, typically that's what I'm looking for on a daily basis is that blend of herbs that are going to protect all of my cells to give me the kind of longevity and, and resiliency that I'd like to have. And are all those uh, green zone herbs that you're describing? Uh, yes, they can be combined. Um, you know, there, there are certain ways. I mean, I, you know, I have some formulas that I typically look at, you know, how do we cover the brain and the heart and the liver and the skin and how, you know, how do we put all these things together? So that's a very different way than the, to look at it than a traditional herbalist. So traditional herbalism was observational. So it was pre-science, they didn't know what phytochemicals were, they really didn't understand the health of the cellular level. So they were looking more of characteristics. So it's like, you know, a trained herbalist would say, well, I know that this person's symptoms, this person's presentation and the way their body is, these herbs might best help that. But taking it down to the cellular level of saying, okay, what are the phytochemistry doing for the cells? You know, how are they blocking stress factors? How are they balancing certain hormone pathways in the body? That is a totally different way of looking at herbs and how we can, can maximize their benefits. And quite frankly, all of it's good. You know, that traditional knowledge balanced with the science of what the phytochemistry is actually doing at that cellular and molecular level it gets, um, yeah, I, I get excited about stuff like that. Yeah, no, you're making me really want to go through the back of your book, which I have after this to understand the, the green zone ones that I can be taking, you know, every day and whether I am, because I do take some herbs uh, through my naturopath, um, but not just, I was thinking more in the traditional herbalist way in that 
I only took herbs besides maybe the, you know, turmeric and cinnamon that I take in the morning in the smoothie as, you know, things that I want to improve and only taking herbs for that. And now I'm realizing, no, I should be protecting all of my systems and organs yeah. um, with the herbs that are known to do that. So I will be doing that. And I know that you would suggest, obviously, because some, some herbs can not only act like drugs alone, but are contraindicated with some drugs that people might have to take, like if they have right. um, a cholesterol or blood pressure issue and they're on that, they can't just start taking one of these herbs that are very powerful for that because it could interact with, with the drugs. So I always thought that was a great piece of evidence for how powerful herbs can be, that they could disrupt something like a pharmaceutical, you know, I thought that wasn't bad. That was amazing. <laughs> and really, you know, just showed how, how uh, impactful and powerful they could be on the body. So in that scenario, you would probably advise people to, to work with an herbalist of some kind to make sure that they yes. weren't, you know, taking things that um, interacted with other things they were taking. And I would assume the same would be true if certain people have, let's say they know they have Lyme disease, but they also know they have um, diabetes and, you know, Hashimoto's, would you suggest they still take herbs that are known to help with Lyme disease? Or is it more important that they work with somebody to have the right herbs for all three conditions? You know, again, what the herbs are doing you know, as far as those green zones herbs that I talk about, they're mainly cell protective and balancing hormones in the body. So they really, they're good for most any application. And the the herbs that I define as antimicrobial herbs. So there are a number on the list, Japanese knotweed, andrographis, garlic, ginger. Um, so there's some really nice herbs out there that have stronger antimicrobial, antiviral properties. You know, they would be more something that you would use in a recovery protocol. And it's not that you couldn't take them every day. Most of these herbs are quite safe to take every day. And, and I did for years, like five years of my life. But it's kind of like, well, you don't, don't we need to keep something in reserve, you know? And because right. so, there's also, there's also herbal and supplement burnout, which I'm sure you've seen, right. Um, there's theoretically a infinite number of supplements and herbs you can take. So you do have to be somewhat yeah, cautious yeah. to not burn yourself out. Yeah. I think, you know, that's the thing. I think people are intimidated by all of the different ones, but if you get just kind of a core of like a dozen herbs, just to keep you healthy, yeah, you can stay on those and be pretty comfortable and you're using a concentrated extract. So, you know, it's not so many capsules during the day. That's, that's a pretty comfortable way to live. I mean, right now I take an average of about 12 capsules once a day, and that includes some krill oil and just some other supportive nutrients and it's just part of my routine. I get up in the morning, I do that sometimes with a smoothie that adds some other herbs in it too. But it's it's really doesn't take away. Now, you know, when I was recovering, you know, I was taking them several times a day. But now once a day, that's generally enough to keep me very, very comfortable. And uh, I just don't even think about it anymore. It's just easy. Uh, yeah, I, I've been a, a long time herb and supplement taker myself from having Lyme disease when I was just 11 years old, that kind of started it all for me. And over, I think like you, when you have something and then various natural therapies help you, you don't really want to stop doing the ones that are easy, right? Like I don't want to stop taking herbs and supplements because they helped me heal. I don't want to take as many as I used to, but I know that they're so powerful. Sure. So I, I like to do it preventatively or to keep those things, you know, in remission. Right. So I've got one last question for you. I've, I can't believe how much time of yours I've taken up with this conversation, but it's just so Fine. interesting to me. <laughs> you mentioned that you took you know, in your recovery from Lyme disease that you took herbs for about five years, which is, you know, to some people quite a long time to others, they've been sick yeah. a decade or two. So it's, you know, not that long, but what is the average length really that you've seen with people having to use herbs as medicine to heal something? Um, right. Obviously there are many factors as far as how long they've been sick, how many, you know, other things they have going on in their body besides Lyme. Uh, and all of that. But generally, I know that the knock on herbs is that it's a can be a slow process. And so how slow exactly do you think yeah. on average? 
you have to accept that I was very symptomatic. I had uh, severe joint pain, noticeable arthritis, I uh, had very bad heart involvement. Um, I ended up with a cardiac cath because my heart was skipping a beat every second to third beat, and I had chronic chest pain. I had terrible brain fog. I had all kinds of neurological symptoms. I mean, my body was a wreck by age 50. And I just exhausted all of the conventional options and was in a position that I didn't have the luxury of going to integrative or uh, Lyme disease doctors and just kind of had to use what I could bring to me. And herbs look good for a number of reasons. One, you know, they had a really good safety pro pro profile. Uh, the cost was not that big. I could order them over the internet and bring them to me. And at that point, there was a pretty substantial amount of evidence that people had benefited from it. So it's kind of like, you know, this is the only option. I'm just going to do it. Um, and I started. I, I just imagine you'd been so symptomatic and you were in such a desperate place that maybe did you think this might be too gentle? Like I need more of a nuclear yeah. bomb. Oh, oh, I was aggressive. I was taking handfuls of supplements of, of capsules several times a day. I mean, I was like, no, I'm not living like this. And you know, and, and on one side, I was really hopeful. On the other, it's like, this ain't going to do anything. But I was like, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to keep slamming it and see what happens. This has to work. <laughs> you know, this just has to work. And about three months, I started noticing a difference. And it's like, maybe it's working. And the other thing is, it didn't kill my gut. You know, my gut was a mess before that. From and I'd, be, I'd used antibiotics and that sort of thing, and it started getting better. And all of my symptoms started easing. And it was kind of back and forth. You know, I I tried different herbs. Uh, it seemed like in the course of my recovery, um, I would develop tolerance to some things, and I would just and I learned to bring on new herbs and rotate herbs. And I did that really aggressively. And, you know, and, and, and it, part of the reason it took a long time was, you know, I'd get to about 70% better and go, okay, life, life is pretty good, you know? And I'd stop taking the herbs. And it's kind of like, this is therapy, this is therapy, this is medicine. You take it till you get better and then you stop taking it. I was and, just about to say that happens to me so much with different yeah, protocols, yeah, whether it's- and, being strict about gluten-free or it's, you know, herbs or it's right. even an exercise and regimen, you start to feel fitter and then you kind of like, don't do it as aggressively. I mean, it's, it's human nature. I, I it, totally it get why it happened. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then some stress would come along and I'd be falling my fight on my, fight on my face and I'd be right back to square one and redo the whole thing. And I kept doing that. And finally, I reached a point that it's like, I feel better on the herbs. They don't seem to be hurting me. I'm going to just keep taking them. I'm just going to keep these, the, these same quantities and I'm just going to hit it. And I did. And gradually the symptoms got better. So now I understand what was happening is it takes a long time to suppress those reactivated microbes. It takes a long time for cells to recover from being stressed. You know, when you look at cellular regeneration and cellular recovery and nerve cells and heart cells and muscle cells, it takes a long time. So it takes a long time to suppress the microbes, put them back in their box, and then it takes a long time to regenerate new cells. And once I understand that what the herbs were doing was promoting cellular healing, which is really what healing is, you know, then, then I realized that yeah, I really needed to keep taking the herbs. And then once I got to a point where I defined myself as being recovered, it's kind of like, yeah, I need to keep doing this just to continue to protect my cells, protect my tissues, because there's nothing not doing it just doesn't make any sense. Got it. I'm so glad you explained that because when you first said you took herbs for five years, I thought, Oh my God, is that how long I should, you know, suggest to private clients or people I know who are chronically ill that it's going to take for them? And and I see now, no, it that was, you know, maybe how long you were really uh, hitting them that hard, but that you started to feel better after three months. And so that's yeah. as long as there's some 
you know, light at the end of the tunnel and, and people start to see some sort of progress with anything like a exercise regimen with how they feel on the herbs with meditation, then there's some, well, for some of us, it means, oh, I can stop. But for some people it, it's, it's a way to keep going because they're motivated because now they see that it's working. It's so disheartening. I find when you're trying out a new thing and after a couple of months, you feel yeah. like nothing is working. It's so hard to keep going. But um, so that's great to hear that it's not just like nothing. And then five years later, you're better. So anyway, Dr. Rawls, you have been such a wonderful guest this time and last time. And I really encourage everybody who has Lyme disease that may have tuned in because Dr. Rawls is a Lyme expert to go listen to his first episode as well, that we talk more specifically about Lyme and also to grab his awesome new book called Cellular Wellness. There'll be a link in the show notes to the article on getwellbe.com, but on that page will be his book link to buy it. And Dr. Rawls, anything else that, you know, you wanted to say before we sign off today? Thanks for the opportunity. You know, my mission is in life is to make people aware of this extraordinary thing that this, these herbs that have always been with us, they've always been there and we're not utilizing for them to their full potential. They could do so much to alter the health of our society and, and it just makes so much sense. So thank you for giving me, me an opportunity just to talk about that. Absolutely. You've made me feel so hopeful about how much we can be doing every day to kind of combat what seems like the rather hopeless situation around devices and EMFs and radiation and toxins in our products. I mean, I feel like I've gotten rid of a lot of things, but, you know, just living in the world, it's, it's hard to avoid. And so having this armor in the form of these herbs wow. is just wonderful. So thank That's you true. again. You know, yeah, it, it, it's true. It's like we have all these unnatural stresses and here's this natural thing that's just perfectly suited to protect us. It's so cool. Yeah, it really is so cool. And I hope everybody else listening to this gets the power of that and is excited about it as well. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you again, Dr. Rawls, for being here. Pleasure.